This is CBC. Good evening. Tonight we begin with a story about make-believe adventure and real-life violence. And what some critics fear is a connection between the two in a game called Dungeons and Dragons. Millions of children and teenagers now play Dungeons and Dragons. They are drawn to the adventure, fantasy, and suspense the game creates through mythical characters and complex situations. But increasingly, parents and psychiatrists are warning that the game is taking some children too far into the realm of dark and violent fantasy. They wonder whether for some children, Dungeons and Dragons becomes more than just a game. Carol Jerome prepared this report. Okay, you enter a very small room, and there's a large black coffin right in the center. The gate's shut behind you. It looks like a few boys around a table, but in their minds, they're fantastical characters in another world, a darker world. Ole is a cavalier. Erwin is a paladin. Dennis is a ranger. Mikey is an illusionist. And Bill is a magic user. Nicholas is a fighter, and his little brother Matthew is a thief. In today's adventure, Mike, the dungeon master, leads them to a castle where they are attacked by wolves in the woods. What are you guys going to do? I'm going to draw my sword and use my second attack instead okay. of attacking. What do you do? Together, they meet each challenge set by the dungeon master according to their character, which can be good or evil. They have magic weapons and spells to use to battle men and half-humans and monsters. And each has an elaborate scoring sheet for his character, with points for wisdom and strength and the like. A throw of these special dice decide the outcome of battles in an intricate scoring system. Okay, Nothing is acted out. The down. real action is in the okay. mind. Now you guys are entering the castle. So you have basically the doors are open to the castle. Sort of somebody taunting your mind saying, come and get me. Suddenly five zombies come up grabbing your legs. What are you going to do? I like to hit him with sword plus three. Can you roll the dice? Okay, you do sufficient damage and you cut off its arm, you dismember it. But you notice that the arm that you cut off is still hanging onto your leg. It's not as simple as old-fashioned cowboys and Indians. The goal here is to survive each adventure and gain points for killing enemy humans and monsters and gather treasure along the way. But this medieval fantasy world is so detailed, so real, that some say it has caused kids to kill in the real world. Since these games are so violence-oriented, you do not just play at the game, you become the game. You are the game. Pat Pulling's son, Bink, shot himself in the heart three years ago, hours after a suicide curse was put on his character as he played D&D, &D, as the game is called. Notes he left linked his suicide to the game. Pat Pulling formed a group called BAD, bothered about Dungeons and Dragons. Along with the National Coalition of Television Violence in the States, BAD documents 28 cases of juvenile murder and suicide they claim are linked to D&D. &D. They say it's the general violence and playing with evil characters, suicide curses, and pretend human sacrifice in the game that trigger the tragedies. Ironically, the publicity about one of these cases in 1979 made sales skyrocket. It has been linked in suicide notes, police reports, and coroner's reports. There have been recently a couple of accidental killings, one in particular uh, related to the game where the boy thought he was a god, therefore he begged his brother to shoot him to prove that he was deified, and in fact, of course, the boy died. I feel they're overreacting a lot. Like, I don't think that this game promotes death or anything, not the way we play it anyway. You know, I can tell the difference between reality and fantasy. Just about everyone I play with can. Sure, there's bloodshed and everything, but I think it's better to shed it in the game than out in real life. My adopted daughter, the fair I Irina, has been these past nights bitten by a creature. Calling the game's the public relations man says the children in the murders and suicides, including Bink Pulling, had other emotional problems already, now, and notes dear, other elements like the presence of guns in the home. There has been zero deaths as the cause of Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, the game is played by some three to four to almost five million people now uh, in Canada, in the United States, uh, throughout the world. In fact, 15 other countries. And uh, the game is built around cooperation. Come on, everybody! The Dungeons & Dragons ride! 
Started in 1973 on a $1,000 loan, D&D now earns $30 million a year for its Wisconsin manufacturer, TSR, with spin-offs like this television cartoon series. There is no escape from the realm of Dungeons and Dragons. Few girls play it, it's mainly teenage boys, and they can spend hundreds of dollars on it in stores like Rigby's in Toronto on monthly magazines, pocketbooks, guidebooks to over 40 different fantasy adventures and miniature figurines. And if they like, there are D&D video games too. At least three government studies in the States confirm a cause and effect relationship between consumption of violent entertainment and increased aggression. Police are also concerned about D&D, but they say they cannot make a conclusive judgment about its role in many of the murders and suicides. One of the most perplexing cases happened here in St. Louis, Missouri. Last April, an 18-year-old art student named Mary Towie was killed by two friends, Ron Adcox and Darren Molitor. All three played Dungeons and Dragons together, Darren intensively, up to 16 hours a day, sometimes sitting up all night with his character sheets. In his confession to the FBI, Darren included his alias, Demon Sammy Sager, his D&D fighter assassin name. Darren told police they were fooling around drinking at Mary's house while her parents were away, getting ready for a Friday 13th party, and tied her up to mess with her mind then put a knotted elastic bandage around her throat and went upstairs to have a couple of beers. When they checked again, Mary was dead, the blood to her brain cut off by the bandage. Darren and Ron then stole valuables from the house, dumped Mary's body in this woods and fled in her car. When they were caught, they were each wearing one of her earrings. The point is, is Darren Molitor a cold-blooded killer or did demon Sammy Sager take over or change him? Darren's trial was first. The defense lawyer maintains that the game was a major factor in determining Darren's behavior, and he is asking for the lesser charge of manslaughter. The prosecution holds that the game has nothing to do with Darren's actions and is asking for the death penalty. Pat Pulling was here to testify. She and a defense psychiatrist say there are elements here that echo D&D patterns. First, the idea itself that tying someone up is a game. The Friday 13th motif, part of the superstitious magic of D&D. &D. The messing with her mind, the robbery like plunder, the running for survival, the earrings like treasure. But no testimony about the game, including Pat Pullings, was allowed by the judge. And Darren's lawyer, Lee Patton, was angry at that, saying the court preferred an open and shut case. In the absence of Dungeons and Dragons, in the absence of the desensitization to violence, I think he probably would have called the police or taking some taking some other action rather than robbing and running darren told lee patton demon has never died and patton is not sure just what that means darren's parents don't know much about it but they feel the game is partly to blame and they say darren was worried that being demon might have affected him and he'd sign everything his papers they while he was going to school as Demon Molitor. The prosecution is denying the testimony on the game. I heard. Do you think that's important that it be admitted? Yes, yes I do. I, can, I feel it'll turn the whole thing around. On Darren's behalf. The victim's parents feel differently. Our own thoughts have always been that, uh, that uh, Dungeons and Dragons were was totally irrelevant to the entire case, that this was a case strictly of, of robbery and, and a homicide and, and nothing else. These were two people who wanted money in a car and were willing to do just about anything to get it and did. These police and FBI agents were struck by how coldly Darren talks about the killing and tend to believe he is just plain guilty. The judge agreed and ruled that Dungeons and Dragons had nothing to do with the death of Mary Towie. The jury found Darren Molitor, alias Demon Sammy Sager, guilty of first-degree murder, a life sentence, but no death penalty. As you near the castle, two of the stone gargoyles come from above and swoop down trying to attack you. The so, crucial point uh, is, can a game create psychosis, or is someone like Darren Molitor an accident waiting to happen, with or without the game? 
Supporters of D&D suggest it might even keep psychosis under control, providing an outlet. Can't give him a proper burial. But the killings and suicides are extreme cases of the issue. Matthew here cried for days when his character died, and Bill's mother says at one point he got too involved. I became concerned, and I spoke to the dungeon master about his behavior in the club. And he did admit that my son seemed to be becoming the character, taking on characteristics of his character. And uh, I felt the same way. And I asked that he not go to the game for a while, and he agreed. Here in Orangeville, another case raised the same questions. A 14-year-old boy, who cannot be named because he is a juvenile, strangled two young friends in this schoolyard. It was brought out in this Orangeville courtroom that the young defendant was deeply involved in playing Dungeons and Dragons and was in fact a dungeon master. But his preoccupation with the game was not considered a determining factor in forming his behavior, only typical of it. He was judged to have an obsessive compulsive mental disorder and was acquitted by reason of legal insanity. The boy will be under care in a psychiatric institution for as long as necessary. Meanwhile, the game goes on. D&D has been banned in some Canadian schools, but is used by others like this one in programs for gifted children. Some teachers feel this role-playing is valuable social interaction and say it even improves reading and mathematics skills and knowledge of mythology and history. Much depends on the dungeon master, the group leader who controls the scenario, putting in as much or as little blood and gore as he likes. Here, Denny is the dungeon master. Well, it gives you a great sense of control and power over other people. Because, like, you can determine what happens to the characters. And it's really kind of neat, the feeling of power you get from it. Does the game encourage or even create Denny's love of power, or is it a healthy outlet for it? In the manual itself, you warn the kids not to get their characters mixed up with themselves. Mm -hmm. It's not a warning. All it is a saying is that you understand this is a game, and you're playing a character, and that's it. Pat Pulling is suing TSR and the teachers who conducted the game in her son's school for $10 million. She wants research into the D&D &D phenomenon. We would like to see these violent games, such as Dungeons and Dragons, uh, taken out of toy stores and not pushed in school systems and remain for the adult population. Well, I think the parents should get into the game to see how it is, and then they can start judging if, they're, if they should let their child play or not. I only play here, and when I leave the store, I leave the game in the store. I go out and into to life. You guys bury the body properly. Perhaps this is the crux of the matter, how we deal with the undeniable love of violence in our species. D&D has taken it a step beyond even TV and movies and books, into the inner mind. Millions enjoy that voyage, but we don't really know how many others find unsuspected dragons in their psychic dungeons. How, then, do we deal with our demons? As you're walking over the drawbridge, the old rotten wood gives way beneath your feet, and you fall 1,500 meters down. So you have died. I'm sorry, but that's life. For The Journal, this is Carol Jerome in Toronto.